Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering AWS Global Summit 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host Corey Quinn and we're here at the AWS Summit in New York City where I'm really happy to welcome to the program a first time guest but somebody that has uh, an app that's on my phone. So Andy Fang, who's the CTO of DoorDash, uh, gave a great presentation this morning. Thanks Thank so much you. for joining us. Absolutely, happy to be here, guys. All right, uh, so uh, you know, before we dig into the kind of your Amazon stack, you yeah. know, br bring us back. You know, you, you talked about 2013. Uh, you, you know, your mission of the company was right. help empower local businesses. Yes. Uh, I think most people know, you know, DoorDash. You know, I get delivery from my local businesses, uh, whether that is a small place or you know Chipotle yeah. uh, or, or the like there. And, yeah. and I love the little anecdote that you said the, the founders actually did the first few hundred deliveries. Um, right. But it gives a little bit of the breadth, the scope of the business now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when we started in 2013, you know, we started out of a you know dorm on Stanford campus, um, and like you said, we were doing the first couple hundred deliveries ourselves. But but you know, fast forwarding to today, you know, we're obviously at a much, much different level of scale. And I think the one thing that I mentioned about in my keynote is just, you know, we've been trying to keep up pace and more than doubling as a business every year. And it's a really fascinating industry that we're in in the on-demand delivery space in particular. I mean, Dara, the CEO of Uber himself said in May, which is a month and a half ago, he said that you know the food delivery industry may become bigger than the ride hailing industry someday. So. Yeah. So just just one quick question on kind of food delivery because yeah. like you know, I think back when I was in college, I worked at a food truck. It was really yeah. well known on campus, and there are people that 20 years later they're like, Stu, I remember you serving me these sandwiches, and I loved it in the community, and we gather and we talk. Today on campus, nobody goes to that place anymore because <laughs> you know maybe I know my delivery person more uh, than I know the person that's making it. Yeah. So I'm just curious about the relationship between the local businesses and the, the people. How, how that dynamic's changing, the gig economy. I mean, yeah. you, know, you guys are right in the thick of it. No, it's a great question. I think you know, for merchants, a lot of the things that we talk to them about is you're actually getting access to customers who wouldn't even have walked by your store in the first place. And I think that's something that they find to be very captivating and it shows in the store sales data when they start partnering with a DoorDash. Um, but we've also started building our products to really get customers to interact with you know, the physical neighborhoods they're in. The, the, the most concrete example of that is we launched a product called in-store in -store pickup product where you can order online, skip the line, and pick up the order yourself in the store, and I think the way we can build the app experience around that, you know, you can actually start building kind of a geospatial browse experience for customers with the DoorDash app, which means that they can get a little bit more familiarity with what's around them as opposed to just kind of looking at it on their phone themselves. Uh, all right, so the logistics of this, uh, you know, are, are, are not trivial. Uh, you, you talked about 325% yeah. order growth. You know, your database is billions of rows, uh, you know, just the massive scale, massive transaction. Yes. Uh, therefore, you know, as, as a, you know, you're an app, yeah. and you know, at, at the scale you're at, you know, technology is pretty critical uh, to 100%. your environment. So, yes. you know, bring us inside that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate enough, and you and I were talking before the show, I mean, we're kind of born on the cloud, right? And, you know, we started off actually on Heroku uh, back in 2013. We, we adopted AWS back in 2015, and there's just so many different services that Amazon Web Services has been able to provide us, and they've added more over time. I think the one that I talked about uh, was one that actually came out only in early 2018, which is the Aurora Postgres product. Um, and we've been able to scale our databases, scale up our analytics infrastructure. We've also used AWS for things like uh, you know, real-time data streaming, they have the CloudWatch product where it gives us a lot of insight into kind of how our servers are behaving. And so the AWS ecosystem in of itself is kind of evolving and we feel like we've grown with them and they're growing with us. And so it's been a, it's been a great synergy over the past couple of years for sure. As you take a look at where you started and where you've wound up, uh, yeah. can you use that to extrapolate a little bit further as far as what shortcomings are you seeing today that ideally would be better met by a cloud provider? Or at this point, is it such a simpatico relationship as you just alluded to, where you just see effectively you're continuing to grow in, the, in similar directions just out of, I guess, happenstance? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think there are some shortcomings. Um, you know, for example, AWS, just recently launched MKS, which is their you know, in-house Kafka solution. 
we're looking for something that's kind of a lot more vetted, right? And so we're considering, do we adopt the AWS version, or do we try to do it in-house, or do we go with a third-party vendor yeah. that's... Confluence hard to say no to these days. Yeah, exactly, and I think, you know, we want to make sure that we are building our infrastructure in a way that we feel confident in, can scale. I mean, with Aurora, Postgres, it's done wonders for us, but we've also kind of been the pi one of the pioneers for AWS for scaling that product. And I think we got kind of lucky in some ways there in terms of how it's been able to pan out, but we want to make sure the stakes are a lot higher for us now. And so, you know, when we have issues, millions of people face issues. And so we want to make sure that we're being more thoughtful about it. AWS certainly has matured a lot over the past couple of years, but we're keeping our options open and we want to do what's best for our customers. Um, and AWS, more often than not, has a solution, but sometimes we have to you know, consider other solutions and consider the fact that AWS may or may not solve some of the future problems we're facing. Oh yeah, and it's, I think that what's easy to overlook sometimes with something like a food delivery service, it's easy to make jokes about it, of oh what, you're too lazy to cook something. Right. And sure, when I was younger, absolutely. Then I had a child, and when she wasn't going to sleep when she was a baby and I only had one hand, yeah. how, do I, how do I feed myself? Right. There's an accessibility story for people yeah. who aren't able to easily leave the house. So it's right. not just people aren't able to get their wings at the right time, yeah. this starts to becoming impacting for people. It's an absolutely. important need. Yeah, and I think it's, it's been awesome to see just how quickly it's been adopted. And I think another thing about food delivery that you know, people don't necessarily remember about today is it was primarily just a very dense urban area phenomenon, right? Like obviously in Manhattan where we are today, food deliveries exist forever, but the suburbs is where the vast, vast majority of the growth of the industry has been. And you know, it's just awesome to see how this use case has flourished with all, all different kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to imagine there's a lot of analytics that are going on uh, yeah. for, for some of these. As you said, in the in the rural areas, the suburban areas, you've got it's not as dense, and you know, how do you make sure you optimize for the people that are doing so? Bring us a little. Say, what, what are some of the challenges you're facing there, and you know, how, how's technology helping? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, with our kind of a business, it's really important for us to get into the lowest levels of detail, right? Just because we're growing 325 percent year on year in 2019. Maybe we're growing faster in certain parts of the United States and growing slower in others, and that's definitely the case. And so, uh, one of the awesome things that we've been able to leverage from our cloud infrastructure is just the ability to support real-time data access. And our business operators across you know, Canada and the United States, they're constantly trying to figure out, hey, how are we performing relative uh, to the market in our particular locality, meaning not just you know, the state of New York, but Manhattan, which district in Manhattan, um, all that matters with a business like ours where it's just a hyper-local economy. And so I think the real-time infrastructure, particularly with things like with Aurora, the fast replicas, we're able to actually get a lot of read hits to these replicas because it's not affecting our write volume. So that's been really powerful and it's allowed our business operators to just really run and sprint. Yeah. So, Andy, I have to imagine just data is one of the, the most important things of your business. H how do you look at that as an asset? Is there, you know, new things that you know, new services that you can be putting out there, both for the merchants as well for the customers? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest ones we try to do is, you know, we never, you know, give merchant direct access to the customer data because we want to protect the customer's information, but we do give them insights into how they can increase their sales and target customers that haven't used them before. So one of the biggest programs we launched over the past few years is what we call Try Me Free. So merchants can actually target customers who've never placed an order from their store before and offer them a free delivery for their order from that store. And so that's a great way for merchants to acquire new customers. Um, and it's a simple concept for them to understand. And over time, we definitely want to be able to personalize the ability to target these sorts of promotions. Um, and so we have a lot of data to do that. Um, and we also have data in terms of what customers like and what they don't like, in terms of their order behavior, in terms of how they're rating the food, the restaurants. And so that kind of dynamic is something that is pretty interesting data set for us to have. You know, you look at a, you know, other local companies out there like Yelp and Google Maps, they don't actually have verified transaction information, uh, whereas we do. So I think it's, it's really powerful for merchants to actually have that. To, to make decisions off of. It's a terrific customer experience. It almost seems to some extent to be aligned with uh, Amazon's professed uh, customer obsession leadership principle to some extent. And the reason I bring that up is you mentioned you started on Heroku and then in 2015 migrated off to AWS. 
Was it a difficult decision for you to decide, first, to effectively go all in on a single provider, and secondly, to pick AWS as that provider? It wasn't a hard decision for us to go to a, you know, a cloud provider that was you know, ready to do like, Showtime. I'd say Heroku is more of a student project kind of scale um, at that time. I don't know what they're doing today. Um, but I think AWS at that time was still very, very dominant. I think we were considering Azure and GCP, I think was kind of becoming a thing back then. Um, AWS, you know, was always the most mature, and they've done a great job of keeping their lead in this space. Uh, Google and Azure have cropped up. Obviously, Oracle Cloud's coming up too. Um, and we're consi I mean, we've considered the capabilities of something like Google Cloud. Their machine learning soft, uh, services are really powerful. They actually have a really sophisticated, probably more so than AWS, Kubernetes service is actually more sophisticated. I guess it's built in-house at Google, so that makes sense. But you know, we've considered the landscape out there, but AWS has served a lot of our needs up to this point. Um, and I think it's going to be a very dynamic industry with the cloud space, and there's so much at stake for all these different companies, and it's fascinating to just be a part of it and kind of leverage it. Yeah, so, so uh, Andy, I'm, I'm guessing, you, you know, when you look at some of your peers out there, and you know, when, when a company files an S1, and everybody goes, oh my God, look at their cloud bill, um, you know, how do you look at that balance? You know, you said yeah. in your keynote this morning, you know, you have like less than a handful of engineers working on the data infrastructure. Yeah. So, you know, that line item of cloud, you know, I, I, I'm, it, 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 I'm guessing is non-trivial yes. uh, from your standpoint. So how do you look at that internally? Is How do you make sure you keep control and keep flexibility in your options, yet focus on your core business and, you know, not you know, the, the, the infrastructure piece of it. Man, that is such a great question because it's something that we get, you know, we, we, we think about that trade-off a lot. Obviously in the early days, what really mattered ultimately is do we have product market fit and do we have, do we have something that people care about, right? So optimizing around costs obviously was not prudent earlier on. Now we're at a such large scale and obviously the bill is very big uh, that, you know, optimizing the cost is, this very you know, real thing. Um, and part of what keeps you, you know, satisfied with staying on one provider is kind of the ease of the setup and, and what you already have configured there. Um, and we've done optimizations over the years. Um, we, we, we have folks on our finance team now who, who, who's basically looking at, hey, where are areas that we're being extremely inefficient? Where are areas where we can do bulk spend? And this is not just on AWS, but this is on all our vendors. Obviously, AWS is one of our biggest, if not the biggest, line item there. Um, and we just kind of take it from there, and there's always trade-offs you have to make, but I know there's companies out there that are trying to sell the value proposition of being able to optimize your cloud spend, and that is definitely something that there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of places to cut costs in that we don't know about, and so, yeah, I think that's something that we, we're, we're being mindful of, I'd say. Yeah, it's the challenge too you see across the board is that there's a lot of things you can do programmatically with a blind assessment of the bill, but without business insight it becomes increasingly challenging. And you spoke to it yourself, where you're not going to succeed or fail as a business because the bill winds up getting too high unless you're doing something egregious. It's a question of growth, it's about ramping, and you're not going to be able to cost optimize your way to your next, your next milestone yeah. unless something is very strange with your business. Yeah. So focusing on it in due course is almost always the right answer. Yeah, I mean, when I think about increasing revenue or decreasing costs, nine times out of 10, we're trying to provide more value, right? And so increasing revenue is usually the go-to option for us. But there's sometimes where it's obvious, hey, there's a low-hanging fruit in cutting costs, and if it's relatively straightforward to do, then you know, let's do it. And I think uh, with all the cloud infrastructure that we've been able to build on top of, you know, we've been able to focus a lot of our energy and efforts on innovating, building new things, cementing our industry position, and yeah, I think it's been awesome to flourish on top of it. Want to give you the final word. Uh, any interesting insights in your business? You know, it's like, I like food and I like eating out and you know it feels like 
you know, we, we've kind of flattened the world in a lot. It's like, you know, uh, I think it was like, uh, uh, like five, six years ago, the first time I went to Hawaii, and I got introduced to Poke. Everybody in California knows Poke, but I live on the East Coast. Now I've got like three places within half an hour of me that I can get it. Uh, so, you know, what, those, those kind of things, what insights are you seeing? You know, what's changing in the marketplace? Uh, what, what's, what's exciting you these days? Yeah, I mean, for us, we've definitely seen a phenomenon where different food trends kind of percolate across different areas and kind of start in one region and then spread out across the entire United States or even to Canada. I would say, I don't know, we, we don't, we try to have as much merchant selection on the platform as possible so that no matter what the new hot, hottest trend is, that more likely than not, we're going to have what you want on the platform. And I think what's really exciting to us over the next couple of years is, you know, last year we actually started, do, uh, we started satisfying grocery delivery fulfillment. So, uh, in fact, we power a lot of uh, grocery deliveries for Walmart today, which is exciting, and a lot of other grocers lined up as well. We're going to, you know, see how far we can take our logistics capabilities from that standpoint. But really, we just want to have as many options as possible for our customers. Well, Andy Fink, thanks so much for joining us. Congrats, uh, congratulations Thank on, you. The, on the progress with DoorDash. For Corey Quinn, I'm Stu Miniman. We'll be back here with more coverage from AWS Summit in New York City 2019. Thanks as always for watching theCUBE.